The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. If we maintain the status quo, cities of all kinds, of every size, in every region of the state will be dealing with a deficit by the year 2015. I think we need to step back and look at the mandated issues and determine what's really necessary. We've got a problem and we can't spend our way out of it. We need to watch our money, how it's spent, and I think that's an important point to take away. Some of the peripheral services like the library or parks and things like that that might be considered to be cut first, we need to think about the importance that they play in people wanting to live in a community and how they make the community more rich. Cities are facing very tough choices in order to balance their budgets. Changes will need to happen to the services cities provide, how they're delivered, and how those services are paid for. Welcome to Community Conversations from Austin, Minnesota. We're here to discuss a very real problem facing the community where you live an impending dramatic shortfall of money to pay for city services. This affects everything from police and fire service to water and power to animal control and snow removal. If cities throughout Minnesota continue with their current funding plans, they're expected to be broke by 2015. Our purpose today is to bring community members together to explore what city services should be provided, how they should be delivered, and how they should be paid for. Throughout this discussion, participants will be reviewing values and considerations that will impact how decisions are made. This event is presented by a number of local sponsors, including KSMQ and the League of Minnesota Cities, in partnership with the Bush Foundation's In Commons Initiative. To get a better understanding of tonight's conversation, I'm joined by two of the organizers from the League of Minnesota Cities, Mary Margaret Zindrin, Director of Communications and Strategic Initiatives, and Kevin Frizzell, Director of Member Services for the League. Kevin, you are the numbers man. Tell us, how bad really is this? Well, Stephanie, I think I'd put it this way. I've been involved in Minnesota city government for over 30 years, and city budget challenges have sort of waxed and waned with the economy, as you might expect. Um, in the early 2000s, there were a lot of cutbacks in cities, and there started to be a lot of anecdotal stories about cities having to make tough choices. And then as the economy improved in sort of the mid-2000s, things got better for a while. But as the uh, really deep recession set in in 2007 and 2008, we began to hear just more chronic ongoing problems. And that's why we um, charged the Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota to take a more systematic look for us and project into the future so we could get a better handle on just how long this was going to last and how deep it was going to be for cities trying to balance budgets. And what did those projections tell you? Well, as you referenced in your opening comments, one of the findings and one of the most startling findings was that by 2015, literally every city in the state, if current trends and expenditures and revenues continue, will be in a budget deficit situation. It varies fairly dramatically uh, in different parts of the state, different types of cities. Some are already encountering deficit situations, others are still uh, in the black for now, but it looks like everyone will, will have a deficit situation by 2015, and it will only get worse looking out to 2025 and beyond. Now you mentioned every city. Sometimes people think this is an issue of rural towns losing populations versus large towns gaining populations, parts of the state, but, but you said every city. Tell me a little bit about what that means. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you've uh, certainly identified a key thing uh, there, a key point in that different cities have different circumstances, they have different revenue bases, they have different cost drivers. So for some cities, the situation does look much more bleak than others. But when we say every city, uh, again, we emphasize if they continue to um, not adjust their property tax levies other than just modest inflation and tax-based growth, if they don't change fees very dramatically, if they continue to try to provide the same services they're providing today in the same way, using the same uh, staffing and equipment needs, uh, each, every city will be in a deficit situation. Even cities that people think of as being fairly wealthy and in a pretty good circumstance without adjustments will face a deficit will by 2015. All right. Some cities have been making changes already. What's their history been and what kind of adjustments have they made so far as they've seen some of this budget crunch come to play? Mm -hmm. Well, I think historically when cities faced budget crunches, you saw modest changes, uh, decisions to put off purchasing new equipment, 
perhaps delay filling vacancies in city staffing, um, maybe cut back hours in some facilities. I think what you're seeing now is cities making deeper cuts and more sustaining cuts where um, they are choosing not to fill even firefighter and police officer type positions. Uh, the truck that's now five years old and really needs to be replaced is having to, to uh, continue in service for another two or three or four years even though that means increased maintenance costs. And perhaps the most concern, most of our city officials are reporting they just don't see things turning around anytime in the near future. Um, really, for many years into the future, they don't see uh, things changing very significantly. Alrighty. Mary Margaret, you've got this event organized to bring people in and share their voice. What do you hope to accomplish today? What we're hoping is that we'll hear from people in the Austin area about the values and considerations that they think both state level and local level leaders should keep in mind when they're making some tough choices related to city services. As Kevin mentioned, cities are already having to cut back on services or get creative about how they deliver services. They're needing to look at new ways of funding existing city services. So we're hoping that tonight's discussion will give a foundation for what should be in the minds of mayors and council members and city clerks and city administrators as they make tough choices about the city services we all rely on every day. Okay, and what's the take home for the participants, the folks who are actually coming to contribute tonight? You know, it, it's a beautiful summer night. People are making time to come here out of their busy lives and based on previous conversations like this, People come away with um, a feeling of having contributed to the future of their community. They get to know their neighbors a little bit better. They may have met some folks they've never met before who share some of their perspectives, or they may have had a, a very civil debate with someone who, sh who has a different perspective on the same issues. Um, so we're hoping they, they come away thinking more about city services and thinking uh, kindly about their neighbors in the in the Austin area. Sure, all right. Well, let's take a look at this conversation that's going to be coming up. We'll come back to both of you in a little bit later in the program. Let's start and join the community conversation from Austin, Minnesota. Well, thank you all for being here uh, this evening. I recognize a lot of faces from some of you who joined us for some of the other meetings here in Austin this week, and we appreciate your coming back as well as the new people who decided to join us here this evening. And we'd also like to express our thanks and appreciation to the Maurer County Senior Center for inviting us to use this great meeting room here in their facility for our community conversation this evening. Well, first, to get us started, I want to give you a quick overview about who the League of Minnesota Cities is. Our city's services and funding project that you're here to be a part of this evening and why we've invited you to this community conversation. The League is a membership organization of all of the city governments in the state. There are 854 cities in Minnesota ranging in size from very, very small cities of a few hundred people to Minnesota's largest cities. And most of them, 830 to be exact, are members of the League of Minnesota Cities. The few that aren't are uh, very small cities of less than 200 population. The League provides information and guidance and assistance to mayors, city council members, and city staff. For example, we help orient newly elected officials to their roles and responsibilities. We provide guidance to city clerks and other staff on best practices in managing daily city operations and we provide insurance coverage to our cities and represent the city community both to the state legislature and to the Minnesota congressional delegation. We are regularly called upon by the media to provide information about how proposed state laws would affect communities and in general speak on behalf of the city community. The League is the main sponsor of the City Services and Funding Project. We've also received support from the Bush Foundations and Commons Initiative that is helping cover and underwrite the cost of this project. Now the main goal uh, is to develop better policy solutions for the future of Minnesota cities by encouraging broader thinking among a wide range of Minnesota citizens. To achieve this goal, we decided that the first and most important step is listening. Listening to the people who rely on and pay for city services. What we hear from Minnesotans throughout the state will set the foundation for policy solutions that are responsive to Minnesotans and will help cities work well for years to come. Austin is one of 12 cities we're visiting over the course of this summer to hold community conversations like this one, gathering ideas, insights, and opinions. In the fall, we plan to broadly share what we heard and begin developing guidance and new policy options 
for both city and state decision makers. For more information on the project, you can go to community-conversations.org. So with that, let's get started with that question that we would like to ask all of you. Um, and that is, what city services have you or a family, your family or a member of your family used today, this very day? Think of a city service that you have used. It could be services that are provided right here in Austin, or it could be services from surrounding communities that you may have visited or done business in, or you may even come to mind and think of services that are provided by cities in entirely different parts of our state. All right, let's hear from three or four of you who'd like to offer that. And I think, is there a person with a microphone? Um, it's going to bring that around. Who would like to be first to just name a city service that you or a family member use today? Yes, up here. Well, I certainly started out uh, the day using water, and uh, thank you very much. It was, it was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> we won't go into detail about what you use the water for, but we're glad it was there for you. Other services, yes. Well, in getting out and about, I certainly use the streets and uh, sidewalk system today. Okay. And uh, thank God our city has taken as well care of the streets as they are, and uh, it's painfully aware that they're continuing to improve. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some of those construction headaches going on, but there's a payoff in the end. Winter in construction. Uh -huh. There you go. Anyone else like to offer a service that you use today? How about someone over in this side of the room? Yes. Over. With the water goes the sewer. Very good. And I think we had, oh, got another one there? I used a city park this morning. Okay, what did you do at the park? I, I walked around the mill pond. Very good, got a little early morning exercise. Okay, and let's take one more. I think this uh, woman right here had her hand up. I used our recycling center. Okay. We had one waiting in our apartment complex. Mm -hmm. Excellent example. Besides the street and the water. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Don, who is going to uh, walk you through a short presentation about city services and how they're paid for. Don? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, again, I'm Don Reeder, and I'm the Public Affairs Manager for the League. And I'm going to give you just a few minutes of background on city services um, before we break into our small group conversations. So this information uh, will be useful for you as you're, as you're talking uh, uh, in those groups. Many of you are probably aware of the most common city services provided by Minnesota cities. Uh, some of you folks just mentioned a few of them. Those may include uh, public safety services, like police, fire, and ambulance service. It might include water services, uh, both clean water and sewer service that uh, one young lady mentioned uh, just a moment ago. It also includes street and sidewalk services, uh, including street maintenance, snow plowing, street lighting, and sidewalk repair, among others. And public parks, tree care, mowing, and animal control. In addition to those, some cities provide uh, additional community services and resources. And uh, those things might include something like uh, public libraries, recycling services, like the lady at the front table mentioned earlier, and uh, garbage hauling. Also includes ball fields, recreation programs, golf courses and liquor stores, community centers and swimming pools, and transportation services as well as airports and electric utilities. And there are some other services most cities provide that are perhaps more behind the scenes. And those would include services like uh, economic development, where cities work to get businesses to locate in a community and also to help them grow. Might also include uh, planning and zoning, where cities make decisions about how the land in a community is to be used. So we've talked about a few of the city services. How are these various city services paid for in Minnesota? We've developed this illustration to give you an overview. On the right side of that are a few examples of the city services that we just talked about, um, illustrated up there and on your chart. On the left side of that, you see a number of reservoirs. And those reservoirs represent the main pools of money that cities draw from to pay for the materials and the staff involved in providing city services. Uh, these reservoirs include 
the city portion of the property taxes that you pay. Also includes fees, like what many people pay for recreation programs or for clean water. It includes grants from state and federal governments or foundations. And revenue sharing, a big part of which is the LGA program. Here, dollars from the sales and income taxes you pay are sent to the state. A portion of those dollars come back to many cities through revenue sharing. Each city is different in terms of where they get their funding. And keep in mind, there are 854 cities in Minnesota. For some, revenue sharing is a main source of money to pay for city services. For other cities, they receive little or no revenue sharing and rely more on property taxes and fees. So what we've talked about so far is how things are today in terms of the services cities offer and how they're paid for. The reason we're having this conversation with you and with other Minnesotans throughout the state is the current way of doing things doesn't seem like it's going to be sustainable for long. There are some stark realities ahead. About a year ago, uh, we at the League of Minnesota Cities asked some University of Minnesota researchers to run the numbers and give us an idea just of what the future holds for Minnesota cities if we stay on our current path. Here's what those researchers had to say. They told us that if we maintain the status quo, cities continue to provide the same services and don't increase property taxes or fees, and the dollars from revenue sharing remains the same, if all that is the case, cities of all kinds, of every size, in every region of the state, will be dealing with a deficit by the year 2015, so just four years from now. We're not trying to be alarmist with these figures. Cities are not going to go bankrupt. Um, as many of you know, by Minnesota law, it's actually not possible to carry a deficit from one year to the next. Cities have to balance their budgets. But what this does mean is that cities are facing very tough choices in order to do just that, to balance their budgets. Changes will need to happen to the services cities provide, how they're delivered, and how those services are paid for. So that grim picture of the future from those University of Minnesota researchers is driven by a number of changes and challenges that we've already seen in Minnesota. Just as the recession and slow recovery has hit families like yours and businesses hard, the economy has had a big negative impact on every source of city revenue that we talked about earlier, that long list. Another specific item of note is years of decreases in state dollars put toward revenue sharing, and in particular, the LGA program. And there are big changes happening with the population of Minnesota. Our population is growing from year to year, becoming more diverse, and more and more Minnesotans are over the age 65. So those factors uh, often require different kinds of services than we offer today, or more of those services. Because these changes and challenges have already begun, many cities have had to change as well. They've done so by uh, undertaking a number of budget balancing actions. These include, in some cases, cutting services, reducing how often or how broadly a service is delivered. In other cases, eliminating services. Cities are also doing things differently. When we talk about doing things differently, we mean exactly what do we mean? In general, anything other than the city providing a service directly, that is, using its own staff and its own quip, equipment and resources. This includes a variety of approaches, including looking for efficiencies, using more technology, perhaps relying more on volunteers, and consolidating and sharing services with nearby cities, with schools and counties, and partnering with nonprofits and businesses as well. Uh, finally, another action that cities have uh, have gone to is raising property taxes and fees, sometimes to keep services at the same levels, sometimes to make up for less money coming in from revenue sharing. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin, and he's going to give you um, uh, some instructions on how the rest of the evening will proceed. Thank you very much. As you'll remember, this is conversation number four of a series. We were here um, in Austin all week, and we started with one about uh, city services and the priority people place on them. Our second conversation was about service delivery methods and how open people were to alternative ways of delivering services. 
Our third conversation was about uh, city revenues, fees, taxes, state aid sharing, and then tonight we're sort of bringing it all together where we're going to focus on values and considerations. The values and considerations that you think state and local decision makers should keep in mind as they make the tough choices related to the future of city services. In your small group, you'll be sharing and discussing your responses with each other, and then your group's thoughts will be shared with the whole room, and your facilitator will be helping you with this. An important note as you head into the small groups, these conversations are meant to focus generally on city services throughout Minnesota. Obviously, the context for all of you is Austin. But in addition to asking you to think about the city services provided here in Austin, we would like for you to think about those provided by other Minnesota cities as well. You all have occasion to visit a lot of cities throughout the state all the time, so think about what you've seen and experienced in those cities as well. It may th help you think about places where you go to work, visit family, go shopping, go on vacation, whatever. All right, with that background, you are turned over to your small group facilitators for about the next 30 minutes. The assignment for the roundtables was to really key in on values and considerations, what they think state and local decision makers should keep in mind as they make changes to the kinds of services cities provide, how those services are delivered, and how they are paid for. As the group conversations continue, let's learn more about this statewide event. Mary Margaret, Tell us a little bit about some of the meetings that have been taking place already. Sure. Uh, there are 12 communities in Minnesota that we're going to holding these series of conversations. And we've been uh, so far to places like Moorhead and Bemidji, uh, St. James, St. Paul, all over the state. And in each community, there are four conversations. Okay. One that's focused on city services, what people rely on most today, what they think might be able to be eliminated or pulled back. Um, the second conversation is focused on city service delivery, what people think is important when it comes to how city services are delivered in their communities. The third one is focused on funding, how people think city services should be paid for in Minnesota. And then the fourth, this conversation, is focused on values and considerations. Okay, and how does someone get invited to attend one of these events? What kind of voices are you hoping to hear from? Sure, uh, for the first three meetings, those are held in conjunction with local partners. So for example, we've held conversations in partnership with Rotary Clubs or church groups. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's dependent on who our local community partner is uh, who the invitees are. But we're looking for a wide demographic of Minnesotans. What we want to do is track with the population of Minnesota so that we know that the results are true to uh, a true representation of the people of Minnesota. The fourth meeting like this one is a come one come all meeting where everyone in the community is invited to attend. All right, great. And, and we've noticed that actually city officials in the case of tonight are not present. Is that by design? It is actually by design. We did some pilot conversations before we did the real thing like this and we found that when city officials were involved in the small group conversations, uh, people deferred to them. They said, well, I don't know as much about this issue as you do. And so they didn't trust their own opinions as much. Uh, the, the conversation also started to focus very exclusively on the community we were in. And what we're wanting people to do is think not just about the community where they live, but cities throughout the state, because we're looking for statewide solutions at the end of this. All right. And many of your meetings have been generally smaller groups. And in this open community forum, you break them down into even smaller groups. What's the benefit of face-to-face -face conversation in this smaller size? It really gives everyone a chance to be heard, to be able to say uh, what they'd like to say. And you'll notice uh, the way these small groups started out, it was very quiet in the room because everyone was given a half sheet of paper and asked to write down their thoughts on the question that was posed to them. So everyone got a chance to really focus their thinking before they shared those thoughts with those in their small group. Some people need a little bit of time to focus their thoughts. They don't want to just jump right into a, a group conversation. So it's specially designed for making it comfortable 
for people to engage in this kind of public problem solving. All right. And how has turnout been so far? What's been your result? Are you pleased with how it's going? We're very pleased with it. We think that by the end of these conversations, by the end of the summer, we will have heard from more than 700 Minnesotans throughout the state. And uh, we will have heard from them not in a survey kind of manner where it's just a, a quick question and a quick answer, but from really thoughtful discussion. Uh, the other benefit of these small groups is that people get to hear the viewpoints of the person sitting next to them and they get to debate a little bit and uh, they get to hone their own thinking um, about the questions that are posed. Sure. So. And since you've had several of these meetings already, are there any themes that are stringing through these conversations that you've heard? Can, can you give us any conclusions yet? Not yet. Uh, we, we are expecting to release the results of everything that we've heard here in the fall. Right now, what, uh, what's happening at the tables is there are recording devices on each table. So we're actually able to get word for word the conversations that are being had. Exactly um, how people are feeling. Exactly. And those will be transcribed. And so the exact way that people are phrasing their thoughts will be what we're working from in determining what are the themes, what are the specific ideas that people are bringing forward. We have heard a number of new ideas that people have brought forward that when we talk with our policy analysts, it truly is a new idea and that's very exciting. Great. And, and these results ultimately will be, it almost sounds like they're going to be scientifically tabulated. What yeah. happens then? We uh, will release a re report of findings um, that is shared not only in the usual ways, sort of through the media, uh, but it'll also be shared with the participants. We'll ask them at the end of this meeting if they'd like to receive a copy of the results of their work and the results of the work of others throughout the state, and they'll get their own, their own copy of it. But we're also hoping that this is the beginning of a longer conversation, a broader conversation that continues about the future of cities in Minnesota. So we're, we're hoping that the dialogue continues. All right. The Humphrey Institute report was yeah. rather grim yes. and discouraging. What's the sense that you're getting from people as they come to this meeting? Are they feeling hopeful or is it a, a general sense of, my goodness, what are we going to do? You know, there are a lot of people that have already started to see changes in their communities in terms of city services. Some of the obvious things like street maintenance, library hours. So they're walking in with a sense that things are already changing. When we share the results from the Humphrey report, that reality is, is brought, uh, is very stark. Um, but they really, in, in these conversations, uh, they're very practical uh, and they, seem to believe that solutions are possible. And I, I think they're fairly optimistic that Minnesotans can pull together all the resources that we have and can figure out a good way forward for our communities. They care deeply about the places where they live. And, and they don't just care about the places where they live, they care about cities they've never been to. And, and that's really heartening. I, I believe at the end of this, we will have new direction that's based on what the people of Minnesota want to see. One of the ways that you started this meeting was with a, a bean counting game, yes. which really provoked some interesting results. It did. All right. Let's take a look at how that bean counter game turned out. OK, so this is our bean counter. We've actually used this to help people understand a little bit about what it's like to be a city council member these days in Minnesota. The bean counter involves eight common city services provided by most of the cities in Minnesota. Things like police and clean water and fire service, streets and sidewalks. And we give people only six beans to divvy up among eight common services. Obviously, that means they can't fund everything with their six bean budget, and it leads to an interesting discussion about the city services that people rely on. I don't understand because I only have one bean left that I thought. It goes very quickly at first. People are able to 
identify their top priorities very quickly, and then they tend to slow down and get more thoughtful as the hard choices come. Cities are reducing the number and types of services that they're offering, um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that their budgets are getting tighter. Okay, so what's left? What, what did you not fund? Uh, senior services. In every community, people struggle with this process. They struggle with this scenario, and they get some empathy for what it's like to be a city official these days. A lot of cities are making exactly that choice, where that's yes. an area where they've been cutting back, and Minnesotans are starting to see the results of that. It's interesting to see how uh, and unselfish uh, many people are, where you may think that if a senior comes up to this game and sees senior services, that they'd obviously put money there, put money, put beans there. But more often than not, they're thinking about their grandkids or they're thinking about their neighbors. They're, they're, they're thinking more broadly about the community as a whole. We hope that as a result of people playing this game, they're sensitized again to the services they rely on uh, every day from their city governments. Uh, and we also hope that they walk away thinking about some of the hard choices that are facing city officials right now. Um, the fact is that the choices made by city governments about which services to fund in the future do affect the everyday lives of Minnesotans. And this, this game, this simple simulation helps bring that to the floor for people. Now what we'd like to do is take uh, some time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, whatever we need, to hear a bit of what you discussed in your small groups so we can all learn from one another and share each other's ideas. So what I'd like to do now is ask each small group facilitator to share your group's collection of its most important values and considerations. Uh, one was essential services. Uh, can we do without something? What is required? Uh, what must a city do? So this was sort of a fundamental bedrock uh, responsibilities of cities. Related to that, but, but something we kept separate as we did our voting was safety of, of people and property and, and just general protection of a city. Our group had four top ideas. Uh, the first one is keep decisions close to the city. Um, and our group discussed how this means that decisions that Chaska makes are going to be different than decisions that Austin makes and that some decisions should just be kept local. Um, additionally, the second supported idea was spend the money as though they are spending their own money. Um, and connected to this idea was uh, be responsible to taxpayers and spend the money as taxpayers requested. Third idea, government can't afford to do everything for everybody. And finally, the, um, that there needs to be parity and balance between the private sector and public sector employees um, and just kind of bring balance back to um, those two different fields. Our top vote getter uh, was actually to reevaluate all current spending decisions to see if there are any cuts or efficiencies available. And a, a very strong sub uh, point of that, that topic was uh, asking our decision makers to make reasonable decisions that are based on the issues at hand rather than political issues. My first one is education. Uh, basically, that we should encourage uh, everyone to graduate high school, and not only that, but stay in town, uh, kind of the brain drain idea. Keep our quality, educated people in, in the area. Uh, next one would be jobs. Not only create more jobs in the community in the area, but good, quality, high-paying jobs, uh, which goes in with our next one of economic development. Uh, don't rely just on two uh, major employers in your town. Kind of bring new blood in, develop the economy a little bit. OK, what we want to do now is move into um, sort of an all-group discussion, so let me just reiterate some of the key points that I heard, and everybody kind of try to get this in your, um, you know, sort of absorb it and think about it as I do these. We started out with Sarah's group, who said that they focused on essential services, um, safety services, and decision-making based on facts, I think was some of the things I heard. Uh, Caitlin's group talked about the importance of local decision-making uh, as opposed to one-size-fits-all-for-all cities. Uh, that w I believe something about owning dollars. Dollars should be treated as if they were your own. Is that it? Kind of basically when tax dollars are spent. 
and that government can't afford to do everything for everyone. Uh, there are some core functions that are critical to government, and then that group also discussed the issue of public versus private employee pay and the need to make sure that um, there's some parity between those. Uh, Mandy's group talked about reevaluating services to decide what's the highest priority and what's most important. Uh, that decision making should be based on reason more than political considerations and based on the service needs of the people who live in the community. Uh, that efficiency is important and something about small impact. I'm not sure I got that one completely. Best efficiency. Oh, okay. So achieve more efficiency, but try to minimize negative impacts from changes in that. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Okay, so much. And then Josh's group talked about the importance of education and keeping well educated people in the community, uh, trying to create more jobs and, and, and try to have more than two major employers in the community. And then in terms of uh, public services, there was an emphasis on safety. So did I miss anything important from any of the groups? Okay, uh, we're going to open the floor now. What does anyone want to offer? What did you sort of notice or hear from the groups? Were there any common themes? Anyone sort of inspired to offer a cogent observation at this point? When we talked about it in our group, my, my answer went something like police, fire safety, streets, water, sewer. I think that's about it because, yep, core functions <laughs> are mm -hmm. that it's very limited in mm -hmm. scope <laughs> and that may not be what everyone else sees as core functions but but that's and apparently my daughter has an opinion as well well and <laughs> hand her the microphone we'd love to hear from the youngest generation here about what they think because this is about the future for them other observations people in the room may have had one of the observations was keep the decision close to the city and one of the things that is becoming very apparent in groups that I'm associated with the mandated functions of both city education and county are really distorting the way that the city and the county and the schools can spend their money so I think we need to step back and look at the mandated issues and determine what's really necessary mm -hmm. okay so that would be more of a message for state and federal policymakers probably right you're talking Okay, but where, where any government is passing mandates down to lower levels of government is the issue and the concern. All right. Good one. Yes, please, over here. We talked a lot about personal response or about responsibility in general, mm -hmm. including personal responsibility, decision makers making responsible choices and not political choices. So personal responsibility and just making good responsible decisions about how we do things. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more? I'm intrigued about how you distinguish responsible decision making from political decision making. What do you mean by that? Can you say a little bit more? Well, I guess I, I just think that there are a lot of times when politicians make decisions based on, on what will get them reelected okay. as opposed to what what the people in their community or their state really need and want. Okay, if that's helpful, thank you. I think one observation is maintaining an overall quality of life in when we're considering cuts, making sure that it's still gonna result in a community that people wanna live. Mm -hmm. And did you identify, I'm gonna play like I'm the law school professor up here, I'm gonna keep asking the follow-up questions. Did you identify some of the issues, some of the city services that you think are important to quality of life considerations? We didn't talk a lot about city services specifically, but I think for sure maintaining those core functions, but also some of the peripheral services like the library or parks and things like that that might be considered to be cut first. We need to think about the importance that they play in people wanting to live in a community and how they make the community more rich. There's one right here. We at this table all are volunteers and we wanted to say that that's part of uh, our very important in a community for the older people to continue to give back to their community. And I think all of us uh, that we are here at this table at least are doing that. Did you feel that there's more opportunities in the community for volunteers to replace city services? Or did you get into that at all? Using volunteers to deliver some city services more than is the case now? Well, there's every opportunity if you want to volunteer. There's enough places here. So there's plenty to do already yes. then in terms yes. of places to volunteer. Okay. Yes. And Thank I you. thought we did very well. We compromised. Now, we really came together. Did you? Did you have a sharp difference of opinion when you started? I'm sorry. I 
I said, did you have a sharp difference of opinion when you started and it was hard to compromise? No. Okay. I just thought Mary Lou hit it well. Oh, good. Okay. She hit it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, over there, please. I think it would be nice if um, more often in local events or state events um, that they would actually have a vote done by the public. Mm -hmm. Um, for instance, the Twin Stadium. Even though that passed, I'm sure I'm not sure that a majority, you know, of the people in in Minnesota were um, in favor of that. Mm -hmm. Just as we're, somebody mentioned the school referendum. Austin is considering building a new school, and we will have a vote on that, which is a good thing. Thank mm -hmm. <laughs> Other ideas. Someone at this table, surely that I don't think anyone over here has offered anything yet. There has to be a good idea or two over here, an observation. I think that some of the uh, services that we talk about that are offered by the city um, are pretty much year to year the same services. There isn't too much change. What does change is the finances of those services. And I think that our city elected officials, when they have to address city services, um, really, in many cases, do not really look at it as a total city. They look at it individually. Uh, I have yet to been, uh, my city council person, for an example, uh, has never come around and held anything in our district that would say, what do you think about this service? Mm -hmm. It's pretty much he or she votes on the services and or the cost uh, by themselves. And so I think that's something that maybe should be considered is, not necessarily a referendum, but it should be how do the people speak toward the services mm -hmm. and understand some of these essential services and the value of them and the cost. Mm -hmm. So maybe cities need to do a better job educating citizens about the reality of city services and they also need to listen more? Is that what you're saying through Correct. some mechanism? There's got to be some type of a feedback mm -hmm. similar to what this session is about here, I think has to be done at the city level, you know, in our own community. Mm -hmm. Okay, good observation. Anyone else? Yes, back here. I would have to say that um, in some ways I was kind of surprised to, to see the different lists because each group clearly went down different paths. And, you know, it, it would be interesting to know how that happened. But uh, as I look around at the boards, one of the things that I see, I think, on almost every one of them is this idea of whether it's efficiency or you know, spending the money carefully or priorities is that um, every city, no matter whether it's a large one or a small one, is faced with a, with a problem of um, wants exceeding uh, the means to deliver on that want. And that um, constantly looking at um, how it's done and, and the money that's available to do it, um, is probably preferable to the other alternative, which is to raise more tax revenue uh, mm -hmm. just because. You know, I, I think that, that sentiment is probably at all of these tables. I don't mm -hmm. want to speak for the others, but mm -hmm. sort of see variations on that theme. Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak who hasn't had a chance yet? I think there's a lot of things that could be cut. We are in a recession and I don't think you can just keep spending, spending, spending. Mm -hmm. I think there are alternatives. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, maybe that's a good place to sort of wrap up the broad group discussion. Uh, now what I'm going to do, I have the pleasure of announcing to you how you voted in the bean counter game. Anyone want to know how that came out? What was the highest priority? Okay. Uh, I think each person had six beans, is that correct? And they and you had to choose among nine services. So you got a little taste of what it's like to try to have to make some tough choices. And the top winner by several votes was the police department with 18 votes, so that's probably not terribly surprising. And close on the heels of that, uh, fire came in second at 14 votes, but clean water and streets and sidewalks each got 13, so you kind of had a cluster there. And then sewers and garbage came in 12th, so I guess there was a recognition if we're going to have clean water, it's got to go somewhere, like somebody said earlier, and we've got trash to, to put out. And then the next two categories down were parks and recreation and libraries, each at nine votes. 
And finally, I'm amazed to tell you, despite our location tonight, Senior Services was the lowest rated at eight votes, but it did get eight votes. So I hope the Senior Center staff here doesn't throw us out now and tell us to leave. <laughs> you did the voting. And the real mystery for the night is that adds up to 96 votes. And when I counted the number of people in the room and multiplied it times six, there should have been 138 votes. So some of you must, reflecting the difficult recessionary times, decided to take your beans home and eat them or something <laughs> rather than vote on city services. <laughs> yeah, plant them in the backyard and make them multiply. So we, got, we do have some uh, frugal, thoughtful citizens here. Okay, um, one more thing quickly. Is there just anyone who would like to just offer a quick sort of inside idea, aha moment as an individual? Not so much an observation about what the group said, but something that just strikes you that you're going to take home with you tonight. Please. Um, I want to agree with the lady in yellow about watching our spending, and I think that's kind of a, a key item in tonight meeting nobody has said we need to tax more mm -hmm. but we're all saying we need to watch our spending okay mm -hmm. anyone else have a, just a pithy little aha moment here I think they're kind of piggybacking off the fact that we were talking more about cutting than spending I think a lot of us were talking about things we would cut in our own kind of preferred areas um, which is a good sign because I think that's probably the attitudes that we're going to have to start taking on instead of protecting our areas, look of how our areas could be cut. Mm -hmm. I think we have a, a quite diverse group here. We have people that are would consider themselves more on the liberal vein and those that are conservative. But I see a, a, a cohesiveness in their approach that we've got a problem and we can't spend our way out of it. We need to watch our money, how it's spent. And I think that's uh, an important point to take away. Okay. All right. That sounds like a good place to uh, wrap up the evening session. I was a little hesitant when I first came here, and then Josh was very helpful. And um, I was kind of sorry it wasn't a little longer because I was just getting going. <laughs> I feel very good about the process. Uh, everybody was uh, active and uh, had good participation. I thought it was an excellent session. But the only thing that I would say surprised me is the commonality of everybody at the table on what they felt the important issues were in the community. Uh, I expected a little more diversity on that. And uh, you know, I was pleasantly surprised that we were all thinking pretty much the same thing. Probably most of the tables were able to come to some sort of agreement on really what are the, the very core functions of, of city governments. And um, so it was a good process. I'm glad I came. I thought it was really great to hear, to hear from a whole group of people. Um, I think it's a lot of things that each of us individually have been thinking about or maybe in small groups have come up, but to have a big group of people talking about it was really interesting. Well, I guess a little, a little surprised that there was kind of a consistent theme with everyone, regardless of their ages, um, about about identifying core functions. Um, we don't, we aren't going to be able to spend like we used to. That kind of thing. Um, that I think from from my age range, that's what I think our age range is very concerned about. And it was interesting to see that 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 was shared by other um, other groups. A lot of things that, for example, libraries and parks, that some people may think about cutting right away actually is a value to a community and could bring younger people to a community, especially a community like Austin, where it's really, there's a lot of older people in the community and they want to start bringing in younger people or bringing them back. Those are some of the things that need to be taken into consideration. Well, our event has concluded. Our participants have gone home, likely to continue this conversation with friends and family at home. The roundtables made some good progress and had some good but tough conversations tonight. Mary Margaret, what were some of the key themes that came out in this conversation? You know, some of the things I heard were uh, comments around core services, essential services. And each person defines that a little bit differently. The kinds of services they mentioned were things like police and fire. Uh, clean water and sewer services. Another key theme I heard was around local decision making. Uh, and someone specifically mentioned mandates passed down from the federal and state level that can constrain the flexibility of local governments to make decisions that are responsive to citizens. 
And then perhaps the main theme that I heard here in Austin was around efficiency and looking at all the areas of spending within the city budget. Um, folks really seem to want to make sure that their dollars are spent wisely and thought that that was perhaps the most important value, most important consideration that decision makers should keep in mind. Keep in mind. You've been to a number of these meetings. Are the values and considerations that came out in this discussion common around the state or are we reflective of what others have shared? You know, the themes that came through here certainly have been heard in other parts of the state. Uh, here the emphasis seemed to be a little bit more on the reduced spending side, where in some other communities it's been much more strongly on the increased revenue side. So I suppose that's not surprising, but that, that is perhaps a difference between what we've heard here in Austin and what we've heard in some other communities. Other Mary Margaret, these small groups had some great but really kind of tough conversations tonight. What were some of the common threads that came out? You know, there were a number of themes that came through. Uh, I would mention the uh, core services idea, mm -hmm. essential services, which each person seemed to define a little bit differently, but they mentioned things like police and fire, uh, clean water and sewer services. Mm -hmm. Another common theme was the idea of uh, local decision making. Uh, somebody mentioned mandates and the problem of state and federal mandates being pushed down to the city level, which hampers the decision-making ability of local officials. And perhaps the strongest theme that came through here in Austin in this conversation was about efficiency and really looking at the spending side of city budgets. Uh, people were concerned that, uh, made it clear that it's important to look at all areas of the city budget, uh, and they were willing to even put some of the things that they use uh, on, the on the table. They, they really sure. said that everything should be on the table, everything should be looked at. Sure. When we had the large group discussion that kind of laid it out for everyone else in the room, did you find after hearing several of these meetings that the values and considerations that were presented here tonight by this group are they fairly common throughout the state, or is our group reflective of the statewide concern? You know, there's certainly uh, some themes that have been common throughout the state. The idea of efficiency and looking closely at the spending side certainly has come through in other locations. Uh, one thing we didn't hear as much tonight here in Austin was the revenue side of the mm -hmm. equation. There are some communities we've been in where they've said very strongly, we need to boost revenues and not be so quick to cut, mm -hmm. uh, really focusing on the future of the community and not wanting to erode quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, there are consistent themes and then there are some things that were more pronounced here in Austin. All right. As we mentioned, one of the things that participants did when they first came in was play that bean counting game, yeah. that budgeting yeah. game, and that's that can be a challenge. How do you think folks did? Oh, I think they did very well. They uh, took the challenge seriously and you could see that they, uh, the first three beans went in fairly quickly, but then they got a little hesitant and thought a lot about where they would cut, what are the areas where they would not put funding in, a, in the sort of mock city budget. Um, and it was interesting to me that uh, with the number of uh, sort of self-identified retirees in the room, that it was senior services that kind of came in last. So uh, they're obviously not thinking of themselves first. They're trying to think about the full community and uh, trying to figure out what the priorities should be. All right. This is quite a project that you've undertaken here to get feedback from communities throughout the state. What is the mission of the League of Minnesota Cities? You know, we really exist to support the cities of Minnesota. There are 854 cities in Minnesota. We uh, represent uh, 830 of those. So almost every city you've heard of is a member of the League organization. And we provide information and guidance to mayors and council members, to city administrators and city staff. Uh, we support their daily work in governing and managing cities. All right. And you have an opportunity for folks who were not able to come to any of the sessions to still share their voice in this discussion. How would they go about doing that? There is a website. It's community-conversations.org. And there people can find presentations similar to what was shown tonight that give an overview of the city services provided in Minnesota and how they're paid for. Uh, and we also have 
all of the questions that we're asking in all of the meetings available for people when they log in to answer those questions right online and that will be input to this overall research uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. All right, great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's clear that allocating limited resources and developing common values is a challenge and the participants here today made a good faith effort to balance a variety of needs. You too, as we mentioned, can share your thoughts and ideas on this important issue by visiting www.community-conversations.org. At that website, you'll find all of the questions that have been asked in the meetings on city services, services delivery, and funding. And you can weigh in on any or all of those questions. Thank you to event sponsor, the League of Minnesota Cities, for arranging tonight's forum. For KSMQ Public Television, I'm Stephanie Passingham. Good night. We just need to reevaluate spending overall, and that that needs to be taken into consideration. And we can't just pick and choose certain programs based on history. That everything should be looked at from the start, and so we can think about those cuts in the beginning. The attributes in a, that make that make a city differentiate itself from other cities is, I think the how people are involved. Not so much what the city provides, but what the people do within that city. The, the town that I live in, uh, my husband and I have just come to love the city and can't imagine living anywhere else because people are so involved. Not, not so much that we have a new this thing or that thing or, or that the city provides this or that. It's, it's that the people are involved and active in the community. I, I do feel that the communities are going to see the handwriting on the wall and they're going to take the steps and measures necessary to see that that doesn't happen. I have a great deal of faith in each of the communities handling their own affairs.